a video on building sets for stop motion, um, which you probably figured out already. Um, I have about three pages of stuff to cover in this video, and it requires a lot of different materials and tools and things. Um, so before I get started, I just wanted to say that uh, there's different tools in different countries. There's different materials in different countries. I mean, if you go to like, uh, I guess, Spain, you can get Jovi clay. In the UK, you get Newplast clay. If you're in the United States, there's Van Aken clay. And the same goes with, um, with wood and plywood products and things like that. Um, every country has their own sort of set of materials to use. Um, but there's always things like plywood. Um, there's always things like, you know, paints and so forth, which are universal. But there's different brands and so forth. So if you're in another country and you get this video, uh, other than the United States, you want to make sure that you know you don't try to find that exact tool or that exact uh, you know brand of, of product that I, I show, because there's really no use in in trying to be that exact. Uh, plywood is generally the same all over regardless of the brand it is or where it comes from. Um, so things like that, you know, try not to get too worried about that. Um, the main thing with set building is that you're just using your mind to figure out what you can build with the tools that you have available. So, um, you know, for example, this piece of wood, there's plywood here, there's, this paint is actually a, the Disney brand of paint for this blue. Um, as well as I think this yellow and uh, we have oak here, we have basswood, you know but I could have used a, a lot of different materials for that so um, it just depends like I say what you're after every single set that's been built for stop motion has a different design to it so you know it's like if you uh, you watch Nightmare Before Christmas and then you watch The Corpse Bride you'll notice in those two feature films it's going to look completely different. Same with the Wallace and Gromit films. Um, the studios there have their own distinct style. Um, I guess John Wright model making in the UK is has a lot to do with that. So, um, as I said, I've about I've got three pages of stuff to cover. Um, I'm going to cover tools, materials, I'm going to cover uh, the basics of building it, you know, how to do green screen, all that kind of stuff. So just keep in mind that if you can't find something exactly as I described, you can usually find something similar, and that's what counts. So don't get too discouraged about getting into the details. Um, I'll just cover all the general aspects of each stage of set building so that you can build your own and hopefully have a successful film. Alright, now it's time to talk about reference images. Uh, here we have a folder for zombie pirates with lots and lots of pictures. Um, before I built the ship set, what I did is I saved lots of pictures off the internet that are reference images. And in particular, I looked up ships. And what I did is I saved pictures of all different angles of ships, uh, different colored ships, you know, different paint jobs. Here's a really neat one. Uh, we have ship reference of, I guess this is one of the Disney films. Um, we have barrels. I found actual schematics. And also uh, we have here different terms for the different parts of the ship. We had the bow sprit, the stem. Uh, the capstan, we have the, the orlop, the keel, the hold, the bilge, the rudder, the tiller, the gallery, uh, the poop deck, we have the quarter deck, the mizzen mast, the main mast. Really neat that I found this picture because it just describes all the different levels of the ship. Um, we also have uh, you know pictures of the tacks used for ship uh, construction. We have cannons, we have Here's wine bottles. Did you know, I mean, did you know that wine bottles were shaped like this? I certainly didn't until I found it. Um, we have a mortar, which is like a cannon, but.
but it's really short. Uh, you know, we have flags. We have a guy hanging off the side here. We have just all kinds of neat stuff. A ship bell. We can see the shape of it. How uh, this loop is constructed, where the ro the rope can go around it. So, reference images are used not in order to copy somebody else's work because there's a lot of artwork out there. Um, you're not copying somebody's work. What you're doing is trying to get ideas so that you can design your own sets. Uh, and how do we go about that? Well, what we do is we go to Google, let it load up here. Now, not many people realize, but on the top left of Google, there's a whole section of links. We have Gmail, shopping, news, maps, and images. Now the images are what we want to click. Not much changes except it says it's called Google Image Search. So for our example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look up castles and we're going to pretend that we need a castle set for our film and we want to get ideas on the construction of the windows. How, how are castle windows constructed? So, I'm simply going to search for castle windows. Now, here's the images that come up. I mean, this is really great because instead of guessing, you know, what a castle window looks like without any clue, I can come in here and quickly scan these images and go, okay, well, here is a castle window. So, I'll click that image. Now I'm going to come up top and I'm going to click See Full Sized Image. What that does is it bypasses all this down here. I don't have to wait for the site to load. I don't have to try and find that picture wherever it might be. Like, for example, here it looks like I have to click or put my cursor over these links to find it. I'm just going to click on See Full Size Image. That singles that image out and I can use it as reference. So I'm going to minimize my uh, my windows here. And on the desktop, on a PC, what I'll do is I'll right click, go to new folder, left click it, I'm going to call it castle reference, I'm going to open it. Now I'm going to look at this image and I'm going to right click it in Internet Explorer left click on save picture as and I'm going to search for that castle reference folder on my computer which is on the desktop so I'm going to save it there click save and there we have a picture now in order to see this easier I'm going to go to view thumbnails left click and now it loads I can see what it is easily. I can uh, I can use Photoshop and alter this. I can use it for reference to, let's say, go to a paint store and find this exact gray color for my my own set. And I can also look at this brown color and try to match that with acrylic craft paints. I can also try to uh, duplicate the shape in my set. So all kinds of stuff with reference images can be done. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go back here and I'm going to search for just castles, period. Lots and lots of pictures. So I'm going to click on this one. Click on see full sized image. And that's really cool. Now I'm going to right click, left click on save picture as, and save that as reference image also. So once I have a small library of reference images, it gives me an idea of how I can build a set on my own. And uh, so that's a very good technique for making your own sets. Um, you can also print these out in a program like Photoshop or Image Viewer. Just click on print. Well, I don't think I've ever printed from this program before, so it gives me like a pop-up thing here. 
but if you want to print this out you can draw over it you can put lines and you can take acrylic craft paints and mix them directly on your printed paper to match the colors that you see if you like them uh, you can take it to a store to match colors you know go to a paint shop and say well I want to have a color similar to this so ask, uh, ask somebody in the store to help you and they'll find one for you you can buy a quart of it or a gallon or depending on the size of your set um, so that's that is the basic way to find reference images and you can do it with anything from you know castles to uh, spaceships okay here's spaceships we have cats alright some pictures of cats uh, houses So any kind of set you're building, it's always fun to look up on Google Images. Let's look up some gothic houses. So maybe you'll find some more unusual shaped houses this way, or you can look up Victorian houses. Alright. And don't you think that would make a cool set? I mean, just the the coloration of the houses and all these weird details and so you can get all kinds of ideas with Google Images um, just by doing a quick search I mean you can find the coloration, the shape, details pretty much everything okay so aside from that we can also look up a program called Terrigen now this is not for reference this is for making backgrounds for your films, uh, particularly realistic backgrounds. Here is an image of what this program can do. You can make really nice looking scenery in a computer, and this is good for vast scene uh, scenery backgrounds like mountains and trees and forests and all that sort of stuff. It's a, a free program. The only reason you would have to send them money is for a license to use for commercial use. But for your own films, you can make a quick background and insert it into your film uh, with the green screen process for free, as long as you're not making money off of it. Um, here's a quick image gallery of things that are made in this program. We have all kinds of skies, we have uh, lakes and water you can do oceans but I don't think you can animate them uh, you can do just all kinds of neat stuff and it looks really beautiful as I said it's free and what you want to search for in Google is T-E-R-R-A-G-E-N so it's just one more tool I wanted to show uh, you know that you can download for free for Windows and Macintosh and have some fun Okay, here's the first tool that I'm going to cover um, this is just a regular power drill uh, I have a drill bit in here and you'd be surprised at how much you would use one of these things um, it's a highly recommended tool probably one of my favorite tools to have because I use it so often uh, one of the, the things that you need to do is if you have a piece of plywood, you want to drill holes for tie downs. And tie downs are how you hold your puppet to a set floor. So you have here basically just a, um, a screw, a wing nut, like this. And uh, you push that through, tighten it down, and your puppet is secured to the set floor for animation. So. The only way you can get a hole is with the drill. Now here's a tip. If, um, if you have any kind of home improvement centers or uh, hardware stores, well, one way to get things like this for free, a lot of times what these companies do, these hardware stores, uh, I got this at a place called Harbor Freight Tools, and I got it free. The reason I got it for free is because 
technically, if um, if a customer returns a um, a product like these drill bits because of any kind of a defect, for example, this thing here is a little loose. Customer comes back to the store and says, "Hey, you know, this is busted." They actually throw brand new stuff away. So, um, if ever you're uh, around one of those stores, look for the dumpster behind the store. Open it up. Just take a glance and see what's in there. Sometimes you'll find brand new tools like this, uh, like this set of drill bits, for free. So it's just like a, a cheap way to get tools. So um, another reason you want to use one of these things here is to pre-drill holes for drywall screws. Drywall screws are used a lot in set building because you can screw uh, wood to plywood. You can screw you know two by fours to two by fours. Uh, extremely uh, popular to use. I mean, you can screw it into a set, unscrew it, and reuse it. You know, ten times if you don't don't ruin the uh, the bit. So um, that's a really common thing. Again, pre-drilling holes with your drill first helps. And uh, one tip when screwing in drywall screws is take a bar of soap and scrape it on the soap before you drill it into the wood and you can drill it back out ten times easier. Now if you want to get curves in wood or if you want to shape wood with details um, one way to do that is obviously with a knife but the other way that I like to use are when I use hand files. Um, hand files are just long pieces of metal and they use a tooling process to cut grooves um, at an angle so that there's a sort of fish scale pattern along the whole surface um, and when you stroke it on the wood it pulls some of the material off shaping it so with wood it's really just a handy way of, of shaping a surface Also, if you cut wood and you have a rough edge, like for example, you can see here we have some wood kind of in the corner. All right, so take your file, just kind of go over it, and it cleans it up really nice. So hand files are used really often in uh, when you're building any kind of set that has a curve to it uh, with planks of wood. I mean, you can also use sandpaper for this also, but, you know, just using a file is a lot more convenient, and you can reuse a file a lot more than you can sandpaper. Files also come in different shapes. Now, here's one that's small and square, and you can see I just kind of held it at an angle and then pushed it along and got these little grooves. So if you have a sort of cartoony plank of wood that you want these details in, see? So it's really simple. And um, I mean this kind of thing would take a lot longer if you're using a knife or anything like that. It's just really convenient to just go like this and voila. Now one of the things that you want to use to clean your files it's something called a file card and it's just a flat piece of wood with little sort of wiry teeth down its edge and those teeth go inside the grooves of the metal cleaning it up and that's how you're able to reuse files so highly recommend these um, it makes your job a lot faster you can also use it on hardened super sculpy plastic uh, pretty much anything but aluminum because aluminum will get inside the teeth and sort of just stay in there and never go away ruining your files so any hard material that you want to smooth or make a flat surface on use a file like this here's the next tool this is just a hammer now hammers are I don't really use them that often um, the only reason I had them in this um, DVD is because 
whenever you're working in sets, a lot of times you want to put shims of wood under your set, uh, under the feet of the set. So, for example, if this is your shim, you can use the hammer to hammer that shim underneath the wood. All right. So another thing is, is if the set is really heavy and you're adjusting it next to another set piece, and sometimes it requires that you just move the set, you know, six like a sixteenth of an inch, just a hair, and pushing it with all your body weight. Sometimes when you're pushing on a set and it's on the floor and you, know, you push it with your body and uh, you know, you just can't get it in the right spot because, you know, when you push it, it just kind of slides along. With the hammer, you can fine-tune and move stuff just barely. So, believe it or not, that's what the only real reason I use hammers for set building. Uh, I don't use nails in sets, so I don't hammer nails in. I just use it for moving stuff around when I have to. That's pretty much the only reason I use hammers. Okay, if you have um, a set that you want to build out of styrofoam, this tool is one of my favorite. It's a hot wire foam tool. It's a sculpting tool, they call it. And it plugs into the wall. What it is, is just a piece of wire between two electrical leads. Now, there's not elect enough electricity running through here to electrocute me but there's enough to heat this wire up and anytime you have a piece of styrofoam that you want to shape one of the problems is that when you cut it it leaves a gigantic mess because it's made up of these little white I don't know what they are they're like I guess technically it's plastic um, and if you cut it with a saw it just leaves a giant mess I guess that fly wants to be in the film. So, what I've got here is just a tool that when you run it through the styrofoam, you can cut all kinds of neat shapes. And, there's no mess. It's smooth. It just looks great. And there's so much you can do with these that, I mean, it's quick. And the edge it leaves is really nice. So hot wire foam tools, if you're building styrofoam sets like um, bricks or if you're making mountains or scenery that's really rugged looking, um, these tools are just a lot of fun. And like I say, they're quick, they're clean. So they're not really a necessity, but you really can't compare it to any other method of cutting styrofoam. So, if you're interested in one of these things, we sell them on the site at animateclay.com. And um, I think that you would really love these. Another tool that is used a lot in set building for with styrofoam are hacksaw blades. Now, this is just a hacksaw blade on a handle, but you can just use the blade by itself. However, it's not as easy to control. Um, but when you cut styrofoam, you'll see it's not nearly as nice as the hot wire foam tool cutting, but it does a pretty good job of getting, you know, straight cuts and so forth. It's also kind of messy. And it really leaves a lot of these little plasticky shavings but um, it's thin so you can really cut through styrofoam a lot easier than most tools especially if the foam is really wide. Okay, I have a variety of materials. I have some basswood, I have some styrofoam, and I have our cardboard here and one way to cut all of these materials is to use a utility knife. So. I mean, you've probably seen these. Everyone's got one uh, in their toolbox. Um, and I'm sure you already know uh, how to use one. I mean, you, you cut. It's very simple. One of the things with these, the problem with using these uh, on styrofoam is that the styrofoam that you get usually 
is pretty thick so you can't really use these to cut styrofoam very well but you can take them and cut them uh, cut angles and so forth on the edges of them so if you want to round off corners and things um, it's a good tool you can also use exacto knives and so forth for the same purpose um, the edge it leaves is actually pretty clean and this knife is kind of dull so you can actually get an even nicer edge usually than that but it's very simple to use you always want to cut away from your fingers and you want to make sure that when you're cutting that the blade isn't underneath your finger like this and if you punch that through you're gonna go right through your finger also and that's a really common mistake that people make when using these things is that they're not keeping in their mind where that blade is in relationship to their hand so just keep that in mind I know it sounds silly but a lot of people make the mistake and you know if you cut your finger well you can't really do any sculpting or anything else with it so uh, basswood is another material that cuts well with a knife like this you can simply score the wood and then once you've got a score line it's just a matter of bending it back and snapping it so you'll get a nice clean cut that way and um, I use that technique to do things like planks of wood for floors um, you know anything that's made from strips of wood you just use that knife. Cardboard is another material that you can use for set building and um, it's really common you know a lot of people use it because you can build small sets best out of it and the utility knife gives you a great straight cut very clean so um, utility knives I mean they're really it's like maybe ten bucks for a utility knife and some spare blades and um, this will get you really far and just uh, you'll be able to I mean cut most materials that are thin even plastics you can cut okay here we have some different saws um, saws are extremely important um, especially if you're building your set from scratch if you're not using a pre-existing table where you need to build legs um, for example it, oh, bugs. Um, this here is a 2x4 if you want to cut this you want to make sure that you have a saw that has uh, a lot of heavy teeth um, something that's really sturdy wide and that you can really get a grip on like this saw. Um, cutting a 2x4, I mean you can cut a 2x4 in about 2 minutes or so with one of these saws. Uh, another saw you could use is a coping saw but it'll take you probably 10 minutes just to cut through it with the coping saw. So the kind of wood that you want to use with one of these saws is more along the lines of uh, plywood that's in a thin sheet now you can do curves you can do uh, radiuses you can do straight lines uh, as long as the thing you're cutting isn't deeper than the saw itself so for really fine work if you have a piece of small wood like this bass wood and you want to cut it you want to use a a hobby saw like this which has very fine teeth and also when it cuts since this blade is so narrow it's going to make a nice even cut it's going to be really smooth and it'll cut pretty quick too So there's how it cuts. 
your hobby saw. So, if you try to do that with one of these, it just won't do the job, as you can see. So make sure you have the right saw for the right piece of wood, and it's going to make a big difference in your set building. Okay, one last tool I want to talk about is the jigsaw. Um, jigsaws are just a, like a reciprocating blade um, powered by a motor. Uh, you can find these in most places, like hardware stores again. Um, and I use these a lot for cutting large pieces of wood that has these curves like this. You can see here. Also on the, on the Defiance ship set, I also cut this curve here with the same jigsaw as you can see. It's like a piece of plywood and there's a nice even curve. And how I got that to be even on both sides, to be you know symmetrical, is I took a piece of cardboard and I made half the curve uh, on the cardboard and cut it out as a pattern and then I just flipped it over in the middle and drew that pattern on both sides of the pencil and then cut it. Uh, it's a really simple trick to getting large shapes even uh, and symmetrical like this because um, a curve would otherwise be really tough to cut with any other kind of tool. So again, jigsaw great for curves. Okay, here we have uh, some of our materials and this is some different types of cardboards that I mean, let's face it, most people throw this stuff away. And you have a box of cereal, right? You eat it. Most people just say, well, it's just a box, so let's get rid of it. But for set building, um, cardboard is a really helpful tool. I mean, or material, because it's really flexible. You can bend it. It cuts well. And um, for the most part, it's a smooth product. Um, and I say product because you always have to usually buy something to get it. So, I mean, you're really recycling something which is really useful in building sets. Uh, we have some corrugated cardboard, which is uh, this box I got from Amazon.com. And it's made up of these little, uh, like, rib wavy things. And then it's sandwiched in between two pieces of paper and you can see that there's a texture to it and it's not really something that you desire in a set is to have a texture like that um, unless of course that's the purpose of the texture and you want that you can just leave it but this kind of corrugated cardboard is good for the structure of a set Meaning that if you're wanting to build it, build it up and make something kind of sturdy that's not going to bend easily, this is a good material to use. And if you sandwich two pieces of this together, one with the grain going in this direction and another with the grain going in that direction. So, for example, I'll just cut this in half. So we have, you can see the grain to it, it kind of goes that way. So if you sandwich these together like this, this piece of cardboard is really super strong. So in that way, if you want to build a set that's really strong, just do that with a layer of white glue in between, let it dry, and that thing is not going to move. I mean, that's really... I mean, by itself, it's easy to bend, but together, really super solid. Now, if you're worried about how the surface looks, and let's say you want to paint this, you want to use a smooth kind of cardboard, like the cereal box. What you can do is you can cut it with your knife. kind of slice this quickly. Oh. 
And look how smooth that is. So, if you take your sandwiched pieces of cardboard, corrugated cardboard, glue a layer of this over the top, you're going to have a really solid wall that once you paint it, isn't going to warp. Now, if you paint this by itself with any kind of water-based acrylic paints or latex paints or spray paints, it's just going to warp. I mean, it's going to absorb whatever chemicals and moisture is in that paint and just do whatever it wants. But by layering it, you're actually making something just as solid as a piece of wood. So, that's a really popular idea for uh, you know low-budget filmmakers that they don't want to go out and buy lots of plywood and spend thousands of dollars, which, you know, especially if the economy's not doing good or you lose your job or anything, it's always good to have a backup. Now, um, here's a piece of cardboard that's actually thick and smooth, which was used to stiffen a, uh, a magazine in the mail that I got. So, you know, there's different kinds of cardboards. This might be good for, you know, for a floor where you make tiles or something. Really good stuff. So, I mean, you can take an X-Acto knife and cut all kinds of intricate details in this. Uh, one of the people that visited my site sent me pictures of some chandeliers they made with cardboard. And they just spray painted the whole thing black. And you know what? It looks really good. So, never underestimate cardboard as a, a set building material. Okay, the next material that I like to use is balsa. And balsa wood is found in a lot of hobby shops. It's considered one of the most lightweight woods and the most delicate also because it doesn't take much to uh, to scratch it or to ding it with your uh, you know your tools, um, your fingernails. If they if they get too long, you can scratch it. Um, it's very very fragile, but it looks great when you paint it, and that's because it really absorbs paint uh, evenly, and it also has it's so soft that you can easily texture it with tools. So it's almost like you can sculpt with it. And here's a piece of balsa, and you can see it's got this texture at the top. And I use that kind of texture on these little wooden shingles on this house, which are also, this is all balsa, I mean almost the whole thing. Um, all these shingles are balsa. These slats are also balsa. The door is made from balsa and all these other details here around the window. So you can see that it's just a really, uh, you know, it's pliable. I was able to get some curves. I got this nice curve by just wetting it with some water and bending it and waiting until that water dried. Um, it's really easy to snap. And it's easy to cut with a knife. So you just take your knife. And when you cut it, like I just did here, you can see it gives you a really nice clean edge. So you have, you know, various edges of the wood depending on how you cut it or if you snap it. You can also take a knife and score it for texture. So for a really rustic shingled roof, you can just do that. Um, and I like to use acrylic craft paints, inexpensive acrylic craft paints to paint it. And there's nothing really more to say about it, um, about the wood itself. I mean, it's just a really good, good kind of material. Um, when it comes to gluing this kind of wood, um, you want to make sure you use the pr appropriate wood glues. You can also use crazy glue, but if you glue any kind of uh, end grain like this, that would be considered end grain, it absorbs crazy glue really fast. And a problem with that is that when you paint it, 
the paint will look really weird when you paint over that area where the, the glue is absorbed. So always use wood glue and um, that's your balsa wood. Alright, here's some basswood by Midwest. Um, I don't know what that company's website is, but this Midwest company actually makes a lot of products uh, out of wood, particularly basswood and balsa wood. Um, you'll find this in most hobby shops in the United States and probably abroad too. Um, it comes in different sizes. This one here has got some blotches of stain on it, so it normally doesn't look like this. It usually looks more like this. Um, this one that I brought, actually they shaped into this sort of wooden house siding look. Um, I know I've already talked about it before, but you can cut it very easily with a knife. And shape it. And basswood is known for not having a lot of grain to it. The grain is so fine that it almost never really splinters. And it just cuts very, very cleanly. So again, I like to use this for things like wooden floors where you cut it into strips. Just like this and it glues well, it sands well, it stains well, and it paints well. So it's just a really great material for the outer skin of your set where people are really going to notice the, uh, the exterior parts. So since it's kind of expensive, you want to make sure that you use it sparingly. Um, never add it to places that you don't see. So have you ever built any model kits before? Now, here's a model kit that I never completed. It's the, uh, the Millennium Falcon. And, I mean, it's a lot of fun to make model kits. And if you're the creative type, you've probably tried to build one of these before. Um, I've made so many of these things over the years that I had this giant box of stuff. That I mean, what do you do with all this? I mean, do you throw it away? I mean, you buy it and you work on it for hours and hours, and then you know you're like, well, it's kind of cool, but do I really want to, you know, part with this? And if you're a person like me who saves stuff, that's actually good for set building because if you have a science fiction-based set, a lot of the shapes in these plastic parts, uh, just you can, if you use your imagination. You can come up with all kinds of ideas on how to how to use them for your own set. I mean, here's a, a shape which you know it just looks neat, doesn't it? So, for science fiction sets, um, model kits are one of the first places you want to check out. Um, if you don't have a box of spare parts. Just go to um, you know a hobby shop and look around, and a lot of times you can find things for your sets, uh, like panels on walls and so forth. Uh, you know this could be I can pop this off and you know put this in, put this on a wall, and maybe paint those little details as buttons, and you have like this instant panel for your your puppets to interact with. So, um, you know, it's just like, never throw that stuff away if you, if, you can, um, if you have the space for it. I mean, I even have, like, a Stormtrooper helmet. You know, it's like a toy that I brought because I thought maybe I can cut the parts up and make that into a stop-motion puppet. I always thought that would be kind of cool. And then I realized that, you know, it's just, it's not made for stop-motion and it's almost impossible to make articulate so you know, I just kind of kept on to that and I have these little miniature collectible things that look like light bulbs so I saved those for set building um, here is the bottom of an ADAT model for Star Wars I think and um, you know, I painted it up for another film. 
you know, it's not really recognizable as a Star Wars prop, but just imagine what you can do with that. So for science fiction models, always hold on to your model kit parts. So that's just another material that most people don't really think about and they overlook. But it's a great source of set building. Okay, here's our next piece of um, material for set building. It's just a piece of plywood. And you probably saw me, I had that on the floor before when I was filming it. It's, um, plywood is essentially, they come from special trees. And what it does is, essentially, how can you explain it? Um, if you look at the side, you might notice that there's three layers of wood sandwiched together. And what they do is they line the grain up inside that wood in this direction. So the wood grain goes this way. Then in the center layer, it goes this way. And in the final layer, the grain goes that way. And um, the reason for this is because, just like I said with that cardboard before, the opposing grains make the wood a lot stronger. And I like to use it mostly for set walls. Um, the reason for this is because uh, the strength of the wood helps to stop warping, uh, warpage. And the warping of wood is one of the problems in sets. You know, if you have a set that you're going to have built over a long period of time and the elements might get to it, you know, moisture and maybe the changing of the seasons, anything like that won't really affect plywood. So, I mean, it's not really a necessity, but it's fairly inexpensive uh, depending on what you get. Here's another piece of plywood that's more expensive because both sides are finished with a really nice oak veneer. So it just depends on what plywood you buy. Like this would be really expensive. That's less expensive. And there's even cheaper stuff that I brought. And this is a plywood you can see below. It's really, really crappy. But it's strong. Um, I don't use this for the finish of my set. What I do is I use strips of basswood, which is a nicer, finer grain. And I painted that after gluing strips of the basswood to this plywood. So there's a lot of different types of plywoods, um, but I never use plywood for the set floors. Uh, the reason for this is because they have a product called MDF. It's a medium density fiberboard. Um, for set building, what this is, is it's made up of a sawdust. And they collect sawdust from mills. They make a big pile of it. They process it, and what they do is they mix it with a sort of resin. And what that does is it just bonds all that stuff together, and then they press it really, really hard and compress it so that it's almost like a you know, regular piece of wood. And um, what you want to do with this is make set floors out of it because uh, when you drill through it, there's no splintering because there's no grain. And for tie-down holes and so forth, that's what you want. Uh, you can see close up. That's kind of what it looks like. So use that for set floors. And for set walls, make sure to use plywood. Okay, here's a material that um, is kind of new to stop motion. Um, in that a lot of studios, what they do now is they use metal set floors uh, in order for puppets to be attached instead of using tie-downs like this um, they use magnets and the advantage to that is a puppet can slide around as opposed to being locked down in one, one position um, some people like that I particularly don't like that but um, it does save time especially if you're working on a film where you know, your puppet's face is in the camera and the rest of the body isn't. It doesn't matter if the feet slide so much. So um, this stuff here is, it's like a, I guess it's made from, well I don't think it's steel because steel isn't magnet, magnetic and this is. But um, this is just a, a piece of sheet metal 
most sheet metal suppliers will carry this. Um, I also saw some of this stuff in, I think it was Lowe's or Home Depot in my country, which is like a, um, it's like a home improvement center. Um, hardware stores, any place like that, um, even Ace Hardware might have some of this kind of material. Um, if not, check your yellow pages for sheet metal. Um, and now you're probably wondering, well, there's a lot of holes in this. So how does, what's the process? And um, this piece here is really dirty, but uh, the process that I saw when I went to Wolventon Productions when they were working on the PJs was they took this, uh, this sheet metal and what they did is they took some spray adhesive and they would take paper like this which had a wood pattern printed out on it probably through like Photoshop or uh, maybe they went to Kinko's and just blew up a picture of a real floor. So they took spray adhesive, they put it on the back, stuck it down, then uh, underneath they would put a really super strong magnet, and the puppet's feet were made from a magnetic kind of steel. Um, you know, I'm not sure if it's tungsten steel or carbide steel. I'm not too sure of the specifics, but um, it was a ma just a magnetic metal. Um, they didn't use magnets in the feet of the puppet, but it worked really well. I mean, I can't really say it didn't work well, but for the walk sequence I did, it was really difficult to control the puppet. So this metal here has got holes in it, so I guess they probably knew about that problem. And when they chose this metal with the holes, they knew that animators would also prefer sometimes the tie-down method. So you kind of get the best of both worlds with metal like this. The disadvantage is that obviously this stuff is going to be a lot harder to cut with the saw, like a hacksaw or anything like that. So you're kind of limited to square pieces unless you want to just spend, you know, hours and hours with the hacksaw cutting through all this stuff. And I mean, maybe if you have like a uh, an oxyacetylene torch or something, you can just burn right through it. But man, that would be tough. So for square sets, this stuff works great. For uh, you know any kind of, I mean, even if you're just lazy and you don't want to mess with wood and you want to just print something out on paper like a wood floor and stick it down, you can do that also. Um, so that's a material that you'll see sometimes, but I'm not going to get too in depth about it because, you know, like I say, it's really hard to work with. Okay, the next material that I'm going to talk about is two by twos and two by four pieces of lumber. Um, the kind of wood that a 2x2 two two is made from is just pine. Pine wood, which is really, really soft, but not so soft that it's like balsa wood. And um, it's very strong in that, I mean, they build houses out of the same kind of wood. So you can pretty much trust it when you buy it that you can build a nice, strong set. Uh, the base of the set is really important because it's going to support everything from not just the set but your puppets sometimes rigs are attached um, things of that kind of nature I mean anything that's going to be above this you have to make sure is solid and the foundation is the most important thing so 2x2's uh, two and 2x4 two lumber when you buy it you just want to make sure that it's not warped uh, sometimes you'll you know you'll see pieces that look like you know like a, a ski or something just toss that aside because you don't want to make uh, make things more complicated as far as uh, especially with like symmetry and so forth on your set you don't want to have it where you have to change your set above because the wood below is out of whack so um, another thing is is you want to make sure that you drill your pieces together with some good drywall screws the reason for that is because they're reusable and um, once you screw one of those things in it's super strong. Nails don't work nearly as well um, but if you are going to do anything like use glue you want to make sure it's a good wood glue. You don't want to use something like crazy glue or epoxy. Uh, another thing about buying it is once you're done with the set you can reuse the wood. Um, so, I mean, there's there's nothing you can't do with it. You can sand it, drill it, file it. Uh, you can 
uh, stain it, paint it, pretty much anything. Here before me I have a lot of various materials that are used more for natural scenery. Um, a lot of things you might not actually think about. Uh, we have here some moss and you can buy this stuff in bags and places that sell model railroads, um, hobby shops, places like that. Uh, it's just, it's real moss, but what they've done is dyed it in just different colors. Great for trees and things like that. You can also use real sticks um, as scale model tree branches and things. Uh, or trees themselves and then glue this to the branches for the tops. Then we have this stuff here which is a very fine sponge rubber dyed in different green uh, I guess stains of some kind or pigments or paints. I'm not sure how they make it but um, it's just a, a sponge rubber. It's, um, it's a company called Woodland Scenics and you can buy it again in places that sell like model railroad kits. This stuff is great for you know little bushes and things and um, any kind of you know leafy uh, stuff on trees or you know just use your imagination. Uh, what else do we have? We have some sand and you can use this. You take some glue glue it down to a set and you can have like a gravel road or um, just any kind of textured streets if you wanted. Then we have here some rocks from a beach. Great for, you know, rocks. It looks like rocks and it's realistic because it's it is, right? So why, you know, why create something that you can just pick up outside in your backyard? Um, then we have here, we have aquarium gravel. Again, it's just real rocks. It's a real, you know, really easy thing to just glue it down to a set with white glue. Um, so any kind of outdoor scenery. Then we have this fake grass, which you can also glue. And it looks like grass. But it's, I guess, uh, I guess this stuff is like a plastic. I'm not really too sure. It's by the same Woodland Scenics Company. Then we have here. This is what they call flocking. Um, let's see if they actually... Static grass flock. That's the technical term for it. This is also from Woodland, Woodland Scenics. And it, um, this is kind of like a ton. I mean, this is overkill for most people here. But what it is, is it's almost like, you know how they, on tennis balls, they had that fuzz made out of plastic? Well, it's the same kind of material, and it's very staticky, so anything that has any kind of a static charge in it, it's going to stick straight up when you sprinkle it on. So what you want to do with this is you take some Elmer's white glue, and you put it on your set, and then you sprinkle it and the little fibers will stand straight up and it looks really good it looks very natural and realistic again um, train shops any hobby shops um, model railroads uh, I guess some craft stores might have this also um, and just to show you what all this would look like together you can see here I have some moss I have some gravel I have some real rocks and also some light brown uh, flocking material to look like grass and it looks very natural and so and you can kind of imagine what a set would look like with this if you utilize all those together and it's just on a piece of styrofoam that I cut and painted so it looks really 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 nice and it doesn't have to cost a lot most of the products you know cost between four and ten dollars each and one bag of moss goes a really really long way All right, this is another material that I found in a, uh, a hobby shop not a hobby shop, a craft store uh, I guess this would have been Ben Franklin's they sell a lot of assorted nylon and plastic um, trees and leaves and you can just kind of go into these places and make like wreaths for Christmas or 
if ever you want to make a display piece for let's say your dinner uh, your dinner table you can go there and buy material like this to do that and a lot of time this is like the the first material you put down inside the um, inside of your ornate bowl and then you'd stick your plants inside of this and it's just like a curly grass what it's used for is mostly for uh, any kind of like creepy scenery or outdoor shots where you have trees that don't have leaves um, you could also use it for bushes or tumbleweeds or anything like that um, so just use your imagination I mean if you go to these places and you're building an outdoor set you know it's just kinda helpful to look around and keep in mind what they have because a lot of times you know people are like well how do I how do I build that you know what do I make it out of but natural materials like this just look cool on their own um, and if you don't like the, the way that this looks as far as the color you could probably get away a with soaking this in, you know, uh, watercolors or teas that have a color to them or uh, spray painting it if you wanted to, just to change the color if you like the shape. So instead of trying to, you know, spend hours and hours making some kind of a tree out of wire that's wrapped around a, uh, you know, an armature and then painting it and building it up and so forth you can usually use real sticks and material like this to make the the leafy areas now believe it or not sandpaper is used a lot not just for sanding your you know your parts for your set but it's used for uh, making rooftops so if you have let's say a, a city building and you want the top to look like a real city building would look you just cut this stuff out and stick it on top of your set. Uh, you can also make house shingles, miniature shingles, because it has the exact same texture as a real one. So I've seen that used a lot um, in set building, just cutting up sandpaper and using the, te the color and texture that it has naturally. So that's another thing to think about. And if you're thinking of getting sand and spreading it around on a, uh, a piece of paper or something sometimes it's easier to just buy the sandpaper that's already glued down and it's got a very even surface okay I kinda regret that I don't have um, some of this material but if you go to places that sell fabric a lot of times you can find material that's furry like this and this is a cat toy and I think this might be real rabbit fur but you can usually find the fake stuff made from nylon which is really similar and for grass, what you usually can do is take acrylic craft paints and then take a bunch of it and put it all over that furry fabric and then kind of comb it up. And what that does is it makes um, grass for sets. And when the acrylic paint dries, it gets really stiff. So a lot of um, you know places like Ardman Animation, I've heard that they use that technique to make fake grass and depending on the acrylic paint that you use you can make it pretty much any color you want and then when it dries you can even dry brush it to um, to highlight the various pieces that stick up so that furry strange material that you see in those places actually does have a use All right, this is going to seem a little weird to some of you but if you have any old socks that you don't want uh, believe it or not, this makes a great uh, tree bark texture and if you take some wood glue or some white PVA glue and mix it 50-50 with water and then dip it into, uh, dip your sock into that mixture and then wrap that around a piece of wire what will happen is you can, um, when that hardens and dries, it will be really super stiff and you can paint it and it will look just like a really old, ugly, gnarly tree. So it's really a common trick that I've seen, um, mostly in wargaming sets, but it really works good, and why not, right? Water is an extremely tough thing in stop motion. Um, a lot of people always ask, you know, how do you make water, how do you animate water in stop motion? You know, I have a, a lake or 
a frozen lake or an ocean or you know just a puddle of water what do you do to, to, to create that I mean in stop motion you can't really use real water because if you try to animate it it's just gonna sink and uh, back into its normal shape at the lowest point of your set so outside of creating like a, a cup of water in built into your set or like a, a bowl or something with water filled in there and it's really hard to to do anything um, believable so what I've seen done in some films is either you can take clay and roll it out into a large flat slab and texture it and then physically re-sculpt it for every frame of animation on your set to emulate water now that's really super time consuming uh, um, I mean it, it works good but you can um, I don't know I mean just the amount of time it takes you'll get frustrated if you have characters on your set um, trying to keep track of the water and the characters that you're animating you know, you're gonna lose your mind pretty much after a while so but I've seen it done and it's possible to do mostly by animating the water first and then green screening it in with your animated puppets I mean that's one way to do it to kind of save your mind from going crazy um, the other way is you can see here I have a piece of this is like tinted glass from a, some sort of a cabinet and I got this thing for free someone was throwing it away and I decided to take it for some crayon glass shots but um, you can see I have a, a little crazy glue bottle here and a lot of times what people will do is to make it look like the um, the puppet is moving on the water or the ship or the boat or whatever's floating is they'll slide the uh, the glass out of frame with the puppet on it so that there's no tie downs or anything going through the hard surface um, that works good for like frozen ponds and things and um, one example is Wolventon's Claymation Christmas where they did that with some dancing walruses you'll notice that they use a, a large plexiglass sheet with um, some kind of blue paper or material underneath that plexiglass. The other way is to use some plastic wrap like this mostly for running water. Uh, you can crinkle it and crease it and move it along in a shot to make it look like flowing water. So I've seen all these methods done. Um, I kinda like the way the clay looks and for frozen ponds and things I like the way pussy glass looks but for moving water I really prefer um, if it's supposed to look realistic I prefer some kind of CG for that to be done but it's possible to do this way um, so that pretty much covers water I mean there's not much more I can say other than um, some things have been tried but those are the most common methods one of the easiest ways to build sets is to not build sets at all, but to use two-dimensional printed images behind your characters. Um, some studios use this effect to its fullest extent. For example, um, a studio might build a set for their puppet, and they want to animate that puppet on three separate stages at the same exact time with three different puppets. Um, what they'll do is they'll take a picture of the set they've built and then they'll print it out on some paper and glue it to some cardboard like this and place it behind the puppets on the last two stages and what that does is they don't have to build three separate sets they just take a picture and put it behind the other puppets and you'll never be able to tell the difference because um, it's an exact copy but it's two-dimensional and it's behind the other puppets and a lot of stop-motion films you think you're seeing a puppet in front of a real set but in fact it's just a picture um, and this doesn't have to be a picture of natural scenery it can be you know a star field or for example you know maybe this character is at a dance rave or something and he's dancing you can just use a real picture 
Um, another thing that people do is they use magazines. You can, you know, find all sorts of pictures, like the cover of this magazine, and just put it in front of your character. And now he's instantly transformed into some sort of nice living room. So, I mean, you can have a character like this, and maybe he goes on a world tour or something, and then he talks about where he is, and then you have a picture that's just printed out behind him, or it's just a magazine. So, um, I mean, it just gives you a lot more options set-wise. Um, some people, what they pref prefer to do is they'll put a picture like this behind the window of their set, so, and then light it, so it looks like outside of their house or apartment or wherever they are is a real place. So that's just one more tool for your set building techniques. Alright, here we have a section on different kinds of fasteners, glues, and epoxies. Um, a lot of times people don't know what sort of material um, will accept certain glues. For example, um, here we have a plastic model kit part and if you're making like a science fiction set and you're kit bashing and making um, you know little spaceships and things out of parts like this obviously if you use something like wood glue it's not going to work um, so for any kind of plastic parts that you're using in your set building you want to make sure that you use something like this um, this is a testers non-toxic styrene glue and I think it's based off of like lemons or oranges or something similar like that. It's kind of like an acidic uh, glue and what it does is it will melt the plastic and when you put another piece of plastic on it, it will actually melt the two together and fuse them. So um, that's for plastic parts. For any kind of, if you're going to attach wood to wood, Wherever you can, you want to make sure you use drywall screws. So if you have like a 2x4 or a 2x2 two two and you want to put them together, um, drywall screws, as I mentioned before, are great because you can reuse these. You can screw something together really quick, um, unscrew it later on in the day if you want to change something. or They're just really, really strong. And they're less likely to split wood than by hammering. So it's a great thing to use. Now, we also have this stuff called JB Weld, and this is good for things that are more or less um, slippery, like glass to glass, glass to metal, um, smooth metal parts to smooth metal parts. JB Weld works pretty good because of the rubber content inside of it, which gives it a little bit of flex when it hardens and that makes it less likely, likely for hard parts to pop off from each other. Um, <clears throat> so that's pretty much, you know, I don't exactly recommend metal to metal connections with epoxy, but if you are going to do that, JB Weld works really, really well. Um, and I'm sure, I mean, you can find this stuff in like automotive shops, any place that deals with mufflers and, you know, selling brake pads to you. Um, any shop like that will have JB Weld. And just so you know, um, this tester's enamel, um, tester's enamel, this tester's glue here for styrene <clears throat> can be found in most hobby shops as well. Now, for gluing small parts like these little balsa wood pieces to larger balsa pieces, I like to use crazy glue. Um, crazy glue is just a clear liquid. Um, it's been around for forever. If you get it in your eyes, it hurts like heck, and you can glue your fingers together. So you have to be kind of careful with it, <clears throat> but any kind of um, small parts like this are, uh, you know, really great to put together with crazy glue. Um, any kind of larger pieces, like for example, these two wood pieces, we have a piece of plywood that's really thin, and a thick piece of plywood. <clears throat> well, if you use crazy glue on this, it's going to be kind of overkill. I mean, crazy glue is expensive. I mean, this little bottle probably cost about three bucks. And this big bottle of wood glue probably costs about three bucks. So you get more bang for your buck if you use wood glue on larger pieces of wood. 
Um, one thing that I like to use for general purpose, um, just you know, putting anything together to anything else, is epoxy. And this is some, I think, Loctite brand. Um, or is it? Hmm, I'm not sure what brand it is, but Loctite makes one that looks just like this. Um, it comes in a tube, and it has a part A and a part B. You cut the tip of the syringe off, and then you just squirt some out. You mix it up with the stick, so it's nice and equally mixed up. And then you can drip it onto your part, and then stick things together. The only thing that this doesn't work good with is um, PVC, the plastics. Um, also metal to metal, anything like that because it dries kind of rigid and you know it's not good for that but it's great for large pieces of wood um, plastic, uh, not plastics but anything that's porous like wood, paper, cardboard um, I love to use it for just making armatures a little bit stronger in fact um, this armature up here I used epoxy to make some connections and it's really super strong. I mean, it's never going to bust. So, again, um, epoxy is a really good material for just overall general purpose things. Now, for temporary purposes, we have here a well used glue gun. I got this in Sears, and it's got a high and low setting. It uses what are called glue sticks, which cost about 5 to 10 cents a piece. And what this is, is just a really soft, pliable piece of plastic that when you apply heat to it, it melts. Now this gun here, as you can see, squirts hot glue out when you squeeze the trigger. And you can see how it's kind of clear compared to the way it was before. So what you do with it is, you just press your parts together. It takes about five minutes to cool, and you've got a part that's glued. So if you need something quick, and you're not going to see it, and it doesn't have to look pretty, hot glue works really well. So after that dries or cools, it'll turn opaque again, so you can tell by looking at the edges when it's completely cool. And you can see also there's kind of like these little spider webs that it creates. And some people use that for things like making fake cobwebs and sets. You can also use hot glue for if you have like a set where you have um, some kind of slime, any kind of oozing stuff out of like a barrel, like a toxic waste barrel, you just kind of squeeze it out and let it drip and it kind of looks like, you know, blobs of who knows what, you know, use your imagination you can also do the same thing with epoxy you can take this stuff mix it up and since it dries um, clear and shiny it'll get really hard too you can use it to look like um, like rainwater like spit and saliva and tears um, you can make it look like again like um, if you take some coloration from um, acrylic paints like this if you mix a drop of this in with your uh, with your two-part epoxy you can make it different colors and then drip it on stuff to look like blood or you know again anything you can think of um, soup or like take a for example a small bowl on a set uh, let's say it's a dinner set and you want to have food inside the bowls mix up some of this with your epoxy and then pour it into the bowl and it'll dry and look like it's still wet but it's actually hard so you can move it around and animate it um, so there's just some ideas and you know it's really important that you use the right kind of glue or epoxy with what you're doing and just to check you can see that this hot glue really dried hard so 
it's quick, it works good, and I hope that gives you some ideas. Alright, when it comes to attaching things temporarily, like set walls, um, a C-clamp is one of the best tools that you can get for that purpose. C-clamps and spring clamps, um, all of those things kind of fit in the same category, but uh, C-clamps are really good because you can really tighten them down by screwing on these threaded rods. So, a spring clamp also, you usually can't get the same width, um, like this here, what I mean is between the end of the clamp and where this part sticks out. Um, the width of that area determines how big of a part you can put inside this clamp. So with spring clamps, you know, you can get maybe a few inches, but with C clamps, you can, you know, get up to 10 feet if you want, if you get the right clamp. So I really like these things, and I mean, they're probably like 10 bucks or so per clamp, um, but they last forever, and they're really, really helpful. You can see here I used some clamps to attach the walls of the ship set and anytime I want to remove these walls it's just a matter of popping the clamp off and taking the whole set wall off and I'll explain later why we need to do that okay the next part of the video we're going to talk about spackling and also plaster and plaster is just a powder and what you do is you mix it with water and it sets up kind of like cement. You can kind of see some down inside there. Now what's so great about this stuff is you can buy it pre-mixed like this. So there's no water to add. It's got, I guess, some kind of water inside of it. And this stuff here has got some vinyl in with the plaster to make it more light. Uh, more lightweight for, I guess if you put it on a wall or whatever, it doesn't drip as much as plaster. So it's a little bit more firm, which is a good thing, but um, it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, as long as you can spread it on something and it dries hard, that's the important part. So here is a castle I built for my first film, Teddy Bear's Mistake. And what I did with this is I just used some styrofoam, cut it into shape, glued all these parts together. Then what I did is I took some plaster and I laid this whole thing flat and I spread the plaster over the parts and as the plaster is getting hard you can sculpt it somewhat. So what I did is I took a tool, a sharp tool, and I scored all these lines all throughout the whole thing. And then it set up nice and hard and it looks like real bricks. Now of course there's a paint job involved and I added some moss for creepy bushes and stuff but for the most part plaster is used in situations like this for any kind of outdoor organic uh, bricks or rock. Now here's a, um, a chimney with the same kind of technique used. I made this out of blue foam, styrofoam, from a hobby center and um, glued it to a big piece of wood and put plaster all over it and as it was drying I just scored those lines to make the bricks. So plaster is used a lot for those kind of things. It makes great looking realistic bricks, rocks, concrete, um, anything in the set that has to look sort of rustic, beat up, and rocky. And one more tip is if you take some plaster and mix it with sand, you can make a great texture that is a little bit more intricate than just a simple smooth texture. You can also use it if it's white plaster to make snow by pouring it in a wet form over whatever you have. Like for example I could take some and pour it on the top here and let it drip down and it would look like snow. 
So that's just another thing that plaster is used for quite a lot. And speaking of snow, you could also take baking soda and pour some all over your set and it will also look like realistic snow. The only problem with that is if you sneeze or blow on it, it's going to ruin your set. If you have a, um, a place that sells office supplies, a lot of them sell labels like these which you can just unstick and stick down on stuff. Um, a great way to, to make large blocks and bricks with plaster is to spread plaster over these labels and then take a dry paper towel and press it into the plaster when it's almost completely hard to make a nice texture. Then unstick the label while it's still a little bit wet. Stick it to your set and it looks like a brick. And you can make patterns that way. And if you leave a gap and the back of the set is painted something dark, like if this is a piece of plywood, it actually gives a great three-dimensional effect. Taking paper towels and dipping them in plaster of Paris and then draping it over shapes is also a great way to create scenery where you have like hills or mountains. Um, you can create really cheap understructures out of styrofoam or crumpled paper or poster board like this and drape that plaster soaked paper towel and um, just drape it over the parts and it actually looks really really cool and very natural so just one more tip for plaster use now here I have a big pile of stuff these are from all previous films that I've worked on um, just as far as material wise goes I've made this door out of poster board which is just a cardboard with a smooth surface uh, balsa wood Sculpey and paint and that's it and I painted both sides different I used a cartoony splatter pattern on this this wall here is also made from poster board and poster board can be found in places like Kinko's or Staples or office supply stores it's just a styrofoam that's sandwiched with paper just like cardboard um, it's a little bit more sturdy than cardboard, but it, you know, it's a little more expensive too. You gotta actually buy it. So that's what that is. And then I used a balsa wood strip on the bottom, as you can see. Painted that. Here is a cage for one of my first films, which uh, this was gonna be a, a second episode of it, which I never completed. Um, this is just made from taking some plywood really thin and painting it with dark paints scraping it with a tool to make it kinda grungy so it's kinda like um like a Jan Spankmeyer type film or something kind of dark like um, some of Fred Sturr's work for the tool videos um, there's also some 1 8 inch aluminum wire which I use for the cage bars um, some stains and that's really it. And some balsa wood, I guess, also. Here is a complete balsa wood uh, set of, what do you call it? It's like a little table with drawers. I used um, two different colored paints, a dark blue and a light blue. These are just little plastic balls made from Delrin that I glued on. You can see also here, it's just kind of glued together with more balsa and I added some little support structures and hot glued it together so really really simple to make this kind of thing here is some balsa wood sticks that I glued together to make just a little picket fence use some acrylic paints to paint it here is a styrofoam log for a fireplace this is made out of some blue foam, which is, uh, you can see here, the same stuff. This is used in house construction 
you can find this in home improvement centers. They put this as an insulation and barrier uh, between, I guess the, um, I guess the exterior of the house and like the siding of the house. I guess that's what they use it for. And um, it comes in eight foot by four foot sheets usually. And then I just took a hot wire foam tool, which has a hot tip like a soldering iron. And actually, you can use a soldering iron as well to do this to make these little uh, brick patterns. Then I took some acrylic paints and painted it with different colors, and that's it. And it looks pretty cool. It's just a cartoony kind of, you know, brick support beam of some kind. Here are some curtains. And the way that you make curtains is just to take fabric and hot glue it into the desired shape. Then what I do is I take some white PVA glue and thin it 50-50 with water, dip the drapes into that mixture. When it dries, the fabric is stiff, so you don't have to worry about any kind of air currents or breezes moving your, you know, your drapes in the middle of a shot and having it kind of pop over when, you know, you're in the middle of an animated scene. So, uh, white glue thinned out with water makes fabric stiff and again you can always buy stuff in craft and hobby shops here's just a a neat little box made from wood that I brought for I think two bucks in Hobby Lobby it's made in China it's it's basically a piece of garbage you know but it's just a something you can start with as a base to paint or add details to if you want or you know, if you don't want to spend a lot of time building a box, you know, pay two bucks and paint it up how you want. Um, ropes. Ropes like this, which I made um, for zombie pirates for the ship. All this is is aluminum wire. I twisted it inside of a drill by putting the, the ends in the end of the chuck. I spray painted it black so that there's no chance that any silver will be shown. And then I painted it brown with some acrylic craft paints. And then dry brushed it with yellow. So really simple. And it looks really like, you know, like rope. You can animate this as well. Here is... Um, this was supposed to be two 500 pound blocks of concrete for an armature animation I did. All this is is straight uh, styrofoam. I painted it gray. I dry brushed it with white. And then I put the little 500 on each side with acrylic craft paints. Again, really simple. This is a set of hills for a background scene for plum crazies with a lake. And I did this for a crayon glass scene. All this is is, again, poster board painted with acrylic craft paints. And finally, we have a brick wall, again, just made out of a sheet of this blue foam. I used, I think, a soldering iron for this one. Just made all these little lines. Um, and painted it with acrylic craft paints, so it's really, really simple. Now, if you're a clay purist, as in claymation, you can also make backgrounds out of textured clay. Um, it looks really cool, especially if your characters are made from clay. And sometimes the colors are really vibrant and bright in clay, which I really like. And you can just, you know, use texture pads and texture, texture it for walls. This is for the credit scenes in Zombie Pirates, but I later toned it down in Photoshop so it's not so bright. And this here is a, from a clay on glass shot. What I did is I melted some clay and dripped it on some more clay, which is stuck on some more of this poster board. And I think what I did is I animated this from one side to the other just for a quick shot. 
just for a sort of abstract background and it looks really cool and you can of course if you adjust the lining you can get more or less texture depending on the, the angle so those are just some more tips for various materials for backgrounds and so forth for your um, for your sets okay now it's time to talk about painting sets and they say that beauty is only skin deep for a reason um, anything that you paint um, is really what people are going to see I mean it doesn't matter what the material is made out of um, painting parts like this and detailing them um, requires some shading of different colors it includes uh, making parts seem darker than others so that there is depth um, for example here on the side of the ship you can see I have some darker colors in these cracks because on the whole the ship is actually really flat and all of these little pieces of basswood that I glued are really it's really thin um, there's not much of a gap another thing like you can see here there's a gap here but there's not here really except for maybe I mean a paper thin gap here and it goes into almost nothing and the reason for that is because when you paint wood what happens is the the grains kind of expand and swell when it absorbs water so anytime you have some kind of a gap like this um, you need to accent it with darker colors so when you zoom back uh, it looks sort of like there's depth but there really isn't and that's because of the way I painted this and um, so here you can see also there are certain things like I dry brushed and highlighted areas with yellow and underneath it's just brown so it makes all these little lines stick out and it prevents it from looking really dull and boring um, now here also you can see I painted this little symbol and to, to bring it out what I've done is I've outlined it with a darker blue color you know very carefully actually I think I used like a sharpie pen or I can't remember but that's the look so I'm just gonna go over the common ways of painting things as well as weathering and bringing depth to what is normally very shallow areas like this okay here are uh, a various assortment of paints we have spray paints we have acrylic craft paints we also have some um, house paint which is this latex that you can get in home improvement centers we have uh, a mixture of various paints in a jar then we also have some testers enamels uh, we also have in the back a big jug of water for cleaning brushes with water-based paints and we also have a very big assortment of paint brushes both big and small and that's pretty much all you need to, to paint sets you don't need to have expensive airbrushes or anything although that could help in some situations if you really wanted to, to use that but for the most part that's all you need and all this stuff is very inexpensive and it's accessible in most places around you know anyone's hometown okay here I have a piece of styrofoam that I just broke off of a bigger chunk and I'm gonna demonstrate all of the techniques that pretty much are the most common uh, I don't think that I'm gonna teach anything that hasn't been done before in the past by anyone else but unless you don't know these tricks you might find it really helpful in, um, in helping with your set painting now the first thing to talk about is primer um, here we have some spray paint which is a white primer um, you can also buy it in quartz like this there's different brands of uh, you know your run-of-the-mill kills or other products uh, I think kills is the most common primer you can get for latex paints um, there's the spray paint version and so forth 
you don't want to ever spray any kind of spray paints on styrofoam because it will eat it and your styrofoam will look well it'll give it texture but in a very negative way because it'll eat into the foam and then spread out inside and it's, it's not nice so anytime you use primer on something make sure that it's not styrofoam and can't be eaten um, if that primer is a sprayable type brush on primers usually don't eat much of anything uh, you can put it on wood, plaster, paper um, I recommend that if you're going to paint a set made from cardboard to use primer first um, there's also in spray paint form I don't know if you can buy in latex form like this different colors of primer but in, as far as spray paints go you can buy this in brown, gray, black, white um, many different colors so generally if you're wanting a, um, a set piece to look really bright and vivid and energetic and maybe it's kind of cartoony you want to use white because it brings out the colors especially if you're using like a light yellow color or anything bright reds for example this, this here would be a good example of a, a bright red color so if you want this to really be vivid make sure that the primer is white if you want it to be more drab and, you, and you're using colors that are greens or browns you want to make sure that the primer is a dark brown or black and it makes a big difference in what the final product will look like um, so pretty much that's it with uh, with primers I mean gray primer is good for just a general overall primer and color um, and sometimes you don't even need primer like for example I'm going to paint this and I won't even use any primer because uh, styrofoam doesn't really absorb paint like wood does or cardboard so the first thing to do is you need to figure out what color you want to use now if you're going to use let's say a red color uh, you want to make sure that you also know what colors you're going to highlight it with as well as what colors uh, you want it to be shaded with so for reds what makes red darker well you can add black that would look really ugly and dirty or you could add brown um, and that would end up giving you a color that's a reddish brown now I've got various I've got a whole big cabinet full of various acrylic paints but basically if you add brown to red you're gonna get a dark brownish red and it's more pleasing to the eye than just simply adding black now if you want the color to be uh, so let's say this will be our, our shade color and if you want this color to be highlighted um, you want to mix it with some white uh, you can also use yellow but if your darker color doesn't have yellow mixed in with it it might look kind of funky so I'm gonna add some white to this to make the highlight and I'm gonna use this reddish brown to do the uh, what they call a wash so here's our piece this is our set piece um, I don't know what this is could be like a concrete wall or um, I don't know use your imagination but this is a set piece and the first thing I need to do is make sure I have some clean water and that's not very clean so I should probably change that and that's going to be used to clean our brushes so I'm going to do that now and make sure this water is nice right, and clean. So we have some clean water that's really important because anytime you have dirty water it's just going to make your the part that you're painting dirty also so we're going to set that aside for our brush to clean it then for later on what I have here is this is a DVD, um, like a blank DVD uh, spacer, I guess. I'm not really sure why they put these in when you buy DVDs. It's like maybe to keep the top DVD from being scratched. I don't know, but I buy these DVDs in packs of like 50 all the time. So I end up having a lot of plastic spare DVDs and these kind of clear DVD things. Um, what I'll use this for is for a palette to mix paints on later. The benefit to using plastic is that the paint won't absorb into, let's say if we use a piece of paper or cardboard, the, um, the water won't get absorbed and dry your paints out fast. So plastic is very, very helpful. Now the first thing we need to do is find a, a suitable brush to paint our set piece. And this one here is about maybe an inch wide. It's made out of some kind of nylon. 
and you know there's nothing special about it you can get it in most um, most hobby shops or craft stores and what we need to do is shake up our paint I'm going to take my brush and dip it in some water and just make sure it's moist all right and then the next step is pour some of this paint out and just paint my part. Now if you notice that the paint isn't getting into all the details just add a little bit of water to your brush and mix that with the paint and it flows into details. The problem with that is it usually takes a couple of extra coats to make sure that the whole thing is coated because the water tends to actually wash the paint away from the higher parts so your part will not have a solid color and you want it to be solid for the first coat so just go ahead and go over the whole thing and when I'm done with this step I'll show you what happens alright so what I've done is I painted all this red area I've done it to where it's pretty much as solid as it's gonna get uh, it took about three coats I left this area unpainted so we could compare later on what unpainted painted shaded and highlighted will look like. So the first step in any paint job is of course to paint it one solid color and one tip is make sure when you're painting that you do a good job. You know don't just slap one coat of paint on there and um, expect it to look nice because if you spend a lot of time on your set or your sculpture then you do a really you know junky job painting it it's just gonna ruin your set so make sure always paint as well as you can because that's what people are going to ultimately see is that you know microscopic level of paint that layer is what they're seeing um, so just always keep that in mind do the best job you can um, and now it's time to shade this color and remember I chose a brownish red kind of color it's um, this one's called redwood oak or Hmm, Rogue Rookwood? I don't know what that is. Hmm. But in, in either case, this is just a really simple uh, acrylic craft paint, same as the other. It's water based and cost me about two bucks just in the craft store, so it's really inexpensive. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a bunch, shake it up first, put it on my plastic here. I'm guessing that's about three drops gonna take this wide brush and just blob a bunch of water on here and work some of that paint into that water I don't just put water on the paint I sort of put the paint or the water to the side and mix the paint in from the edge and that way you can control how dark your color is or how dark your wash is I guess so as you can see here I've loaded the paintbrush with water and some paint and I want to make sure that this is really thin so that when I paint over this all of the color is going to go down into the details and this is what you call a wash and you just want to take it and blot it into the the part and what you'll see is that the top areas won't have much paint but the bottom areas all that paint is going to go right down into those details from gravity and because it's too thin for it to adhere to the top surfaces so just keep on mixing a little water in adding some paint and then going over it and I don't know if can you see that any kind of difference well, it might be kind of hard with this camera, and it's probably going to take me a few coats of this wash to build it up to where the crevices have enough dark paint in them for it to make much of a difference. Because I can see with the styrofoam that it's almost soaking it up. So I'm going to do a few coats like this. I'll wait for the uh, each coat to dry in between, and we'll see how it turns out. So here is 
unpainted, painted with red, and an area of uh, painted red with a wash, and that wash went down into all the little details, and you can see that it also muted this red, so it's not so vivid. And one thing about painting sets is you don't want to have the color so bright like this because the camera usually sees that and it doesn't like it. So if you're filming something with a, a still camera or anything else, um, even if the still images look okay in the image itself, these bright red colors don't usually um, go over too well when it's on a TV screen. So if your animation is on a DVD or anything, it's going to look really weird. And a lot of times you'll get lines across the TV screen and stuff when you get these weird colors. Um, so washing it does two things. It just takes out that, you know, that heat as far as the light coming off of it. And it makes it look a little bit more drab. So that's what you call a wash. That's usually the second stage of painting most set pieces. And just as an example of a set piece, here is the uh, the barrel for zombie pirates. And I did a wash inside these cracks to give them some depth with a very dark brown. And these parts are a light brown. So again, a wash is just to give more depth and to uh, usually to tone down a certain color if it's really vivid like this red or if you have like a, a yellow um, if you use yellow you could do a wash with orange uh, or mix some brown in with the yellow that's a good way to do it um, and the next stage is to highlight this so I'm gonna do that in the last part of this piece of styrofoam and the way you do it is you want to make sure that your paint isn't too thin now this is actually really thin. If I can hear that like water splashing in the paint, it's not so great. But in this case, I don't have a choice because that's how it came when I brought that paint. So what we want to do is we want to mix that with some white acrylic. And here I have some white acrylic. Again, it's just a craft paint. I paid about two bucks. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my plastic. I'm going to take some red and put it on here a few drops. It's a really thin paint. Then I'm going to take some white. I think this white is kind of thick which is good because it'll offset the amount of water in that red paint. Whoa! It's not good. I just blew the paint away. Alright, so there it is. You can see the difference in the thickness of this paint. is really thick. It's making little mountains and stuff. So that's good because we want that red to be thick also. Then we're going to have to decide on a brush for the dry brushing. And dry brushing destroys brush bristles. So, for example, this one here I've used. It used to have a nice fine tip, but since I used it for dry brushing, the tip isn't so nice anymore. So, let's see, what's a good brush? Well, I think I'll use the same brush I used to paint the, the red with. And for this, what you need to do for the dry brushing is to make sure your brush is extremely dry. And to do that, just take some paper towels, dry the brush off as good as you can, The next thing is to mix your white and red together until we get somewhat of a pink color. So I kind of put the two colors side by side, red here, white here, and then I bring the red into the white and mix it together. And that gives you a lot of control when mixing paints because if I were to take that red and just blob a bunch of white on it, I couldn't really control how much of the paint goes in there because when you squeeze it, you don't really know how much is going to plop out of your container. So I'm just going to mix these together. So I've got this sort of medium pink 
And the trick to dry brushing is you want to dip just the, the tip of your bristles in the paint like this. And then you want to dab it on a paper towel. And then you want to test it to make sure that there's not too much paint on these bristles. So you can take your fingernail and do it or a scrap piece of wood or anything. Um, and then you want to take your part and just go like this. One direction up and down is preferred, but you can go in any direction you want. And this is a trick they did on Nightmare Before Christmas for all those hills and stuff in the background, which were generally all black. And then they would just do this to bring out the details. And that is all there is to it. So we went from white, painted red, a dark wash, and then highlighted. Let's see if I can change the angle here and maybe get a better view. And that's really all there is to it. It's very simple but it makes your sets look a lot more professional when you follow all those steps. These paints here are Tester's Gloss Enamels. Now, actually I think this might be flat. That is flat. Um, I don't recommend these too much. Uh, they're a little bit expensive. They require toxic paint thinner to uh, to clean your brushes, but they're good for things like you know small details that are glossy. Um, I don't ever paint any broad areas with these kind of paints. You can also airbrush them with more thinner to thin them down, and uh, I mean you can find them in most places that sell model cars and plastic train kits and uh, or model kits so I just wanted to cover that but like I say I don't really recommend these unless it's for some kind of small detail like painting eyeballs now what we're gonna do next is I'm gonna explain weathering techniques and this here is just a an old model kit of a, a chicken walker or a ATST from uh, Empire or Return of the Jedi, I guess. Hmm. Or was it Empire? Well, I guess the first one was an Empire Strikes Back, but uh, they didn't actually go with those designs later on, which is what this is. So I brought this model kit, and it's been, you know, messed up for years and years, but I have it in a box. So I'm just going to use it to demonstrate some different techniques in weathering. Now, the first is um, a lot of people will want to know how to make rust and how to apply it to a part to make it look like maybe something's been out in the rain. So metal parts are probably the most common things to weather, but this can also include, you know, this the bottom of houses or barns or any kind of building where mud splashes up on it or the bottom of trucks, let's say around the tires and so forth. The kind of coloration you want to use are these we have some brown, which is similar to rust, orange, and this color is sort of in between both of those. It's kind of a reddish brown orange color. So in combination, these three colors were great from painting on rust. And there's not much to really say about it. All you want to do is you want to add it to areas where something will have uh, you know rust lines or for example, if this is a piece of metal that's been out in the rain, you want to think about how rust really looks. So water will kind of drip down into the cracks, and what will happen is gravity will take over and the water will drip down, and it will carry those rusty colors with it. Um, and I've seen, the first time I saw rust was when I worked for Webster Culcord, and he had a set with some various uh, browns, and oranges on like a pipe for a sink. So what I'm going to try to do here is show you roughly how it's done. Now I'm going against my advice here and I'm using a piece of paper for this but plastic is a lot better. 
So you want to squirt some browns out. And if it's not squirting, just remove the cap. Kind of dip down inside there. So you can really make this nice and thin, this paint. Take your part, let it go into these cracks. Alright, so we have like a little rust line here. Kind of use your discretion. Now I've heard that you can take things like Windex and mix it with your paints and it will flow into fine details. And there's all kinds of little tricks that you can find on the internet that I've read, but if you're using water paints, water-based acrylic paints, there's no reason why you had to use toxic chemicals with them to, um, to get them to do what you want. So we have a rust line. Now, if you've ever looked at a part that's got a lot of caked up rust on it, and what I mean by that is the rust is so thick that it's, it leaves like a texture. What you want to do is you want to kind of build up your acrylic paint and make it thick in spots. And again, just let gravity take it. If it's going to take it down or into cracks, just let it go in there. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a hair dryer and I'm just going to blow blow dry this really quick so it dries. And then I'll show you what I do so next. I just took a blow dryer and I just blow dried this area so that there's no more water. And one trick is to take a uh, an old toothbrush, dip the tip into your paint, and then flick it onto your part. So what that does is it just kind of like leaves a little texture and spreads that rust out. I mean, it just depends on what, what look you're after. Um, you can use that with dark browns. You can use it with black. And you can also use that to make like a cartoony uh, pattern on a cartoony set. So if your background is a yellow, you can... Uh, you can take like blues or you could take red and make like a splotchy pattern. So you want to make sure that the paint is thinned. Um, let's see, the other technique if you don't have an old paintbrush is to splatter it. <clears throat> let's see, pour out a drop of paint. This is kind of tough because I have to do this at an angle for the camera, but you thin out a bunch of paint and then you can just like knock it off to the side and make sure that you're getting what you want. And that's kind of too watery for me, so let's see. There we go. I'm just going to kind of knock this brush above it. Get a splatter. And then if you don't like what you see, or you want to, let's say for example, here you can see that the paint's kind of thick and it left a bunch of bumps. Just take a paper towel, blot it up, and it will leave behind just, you know, some small details. It's not too much, uh, not too much paint that way. What else? I mean, that's pretty much all there is to weathering. Um, just look at stuff in nature. Look at stuff. Look at pictures of old barns or cars that are rusted out on the side of the highway. And you can see how rust behaves um, in those situations. Now, another thing is if you have something where, let's say, this, this is metal, and you want to have some metal exposed, what we're going to use is some black paint and some acrylic silver and what you want to do is you want to take some black again just pour a drop out you don't need 10 gallons of paint to do this it's very s simple doesn't require a lot of paint and you want to take and you want to make a little splotch 
let's say here is some metal and metal usually gets exposed where it's rubbed around edges of things so I'm just kind of gonna kind of make a pattern all right so we have you know we have a scratch maybe um, this is a piece of machinery and maybe it banged into something or who knows so it's going to make that a nice solid color and once it's nice and thick and solid I'm going to take a hair dryer and make sure this is nice and dry once your paint is dry I'm going to take some of this silver paint put it on my brush and then I'm going to paint everything except for the very edge of that black what this does is it leaves a thin line of black and it gives it depth so it looks like that paint is really coming off and if you're a Star Wars fan you'll know that this is the technique they used for Boba Fett's helmet. So here you can see any paint that's been removed it's going to be silver. That edge will give this some depth. It's going to look really cool. I've also seen some people do this where they take some tape and they will take like tape and masking tape and they'll paint the whole thing silver first put the masking tape where they don't want where they want the silver exposed and then paint over the whole thing the color that they want and then when they remove the tape you'll see the silver but to me it's you know this works just as well but you can do it either way. So here's just what it looks like. So we've weathered it. We scratched some paint off. We've made it rusty. And uh, you know, that's pretty extreme, but that's the general idea behind weathering. Okay, a cartoony splatter look like this is, you know, a lot of cartoon films have a splatter to them and it just kind of gives a festive look a little bit more energy to your your parts um, I guess like if you watch a Ren and Stimpy cartoon you'll notice in the backgrounds of Ren and Stimpy or um, Doug or any of these kind of cartoons they'll use this splatter technique which I mean usually it incorporates uh, reversing the colors like if you have a dark blue or a, if you have blue and then a yellow you splatter the yellow with blue and you splatter the blue with yellow and also you can splatter a darker blue first and then a yellow for a highlight so I see that a lot in um, in films but I guess John Lemon Films is one of the places that uses this the most and as I said again this is a trick by Mike Rosinski you can either thin down paints uh, acrylic craft paints take a brush and hold it over your part and just shake it over the part and let the water um, carry the paint onto the part uh, you can't use just straight paint because it's too thick so the other trick is to take a spray can like this and you want to hold it far back from your part and you want to try and barely press on the trigger and you'll see that it will kind of splatter out Let's see if I can do it it's pretty tough Okay, now I didn't shake this, so the pigment didn't really mix in properly, but you can see how you get a nice splatter technique. Again, this is also good for weathering. You can make something look like concrete this way. Just use some paint that is, uh, you know, a dark color, dark gray, and 
use whites and blacks and kind of just kind of you know jumble it up uh, it also is great for cartoony hills or skies I mean pretty much anything so it's just another technique you can use. I mean, the last technique is to use small spray bottles you can use these for weathering as well as the splatter technique by thinning down some paint with water in here and just spraying it really simple Okay, the next shading technique and final thing I'm going to talk about with regards to painting is here is a character which is maybe an inch tall and you can see there's a lot of details and there's a lot of shading going on here and when you're painting a, a small object or a large one you can either dry brush it to get highlights or you can use another technique that technique is to use a base color paint now for example here's we're using greens for his arm for example so we'll use a neutral green color then you do uh, a wash so you get into all these recessed areas with the wash makes them nice and dark and then for the light areas what you want to do is you mix up uh, some yellow with the green paint it on only the high spots then you make another color by simply adding more yellow to the same green to make it a lighter shade and you paint it into the high spots but you only paint it in a smaller area and then mix up more yellow and then paint it in the very very tip of that area to create layers of shade so just to quickly demonstrate what I'm talking about, let's say you have an object that's shaped like this and you want to highlight it. So you would paint the whole thing green, one shade, mix up some yellow with it, paint only this area, mix up more yellow with it, paint only this area, and mix up even more yellow, and paint the very tip this gives you one two three four different shades as opposed to just dry brushing the whole thing and having one shade at the very top like this so it just gives you more depth and for really small objects where you know for example if you look at this character at a distance if you just dry brush it you only have two layers of depth and it won't look very nice so adding lots of layers, one on top of another, makes a huge difference. So once again, here is the standard technique. Painting, washing, and dry brushing to make this look. So you have essentially one, two, three layers of depth. The base, the wash, and the highlight. Now, if you're painting something flat, like a piece of wood that has no texture, now this does have some texture, but uh, look at the back of this door, and you'll see that it looks really, really plain and simple. But if you paint it this way, what, by using the same technique I just demonstrated, where you use several different shades of the same color, the door really comes to life. And that's the whole purpose of painting, is to bring out, uh, you know, a different sort of energy from the door, I guess. You know, it's like, here's a plain, one-shaded door. It has three lines in it, and there's nothing special at it at all. And this just brings out a lot of character. I mean, the door kind of comes to life. And all I did is take some, uh, some brown, mix it with yellow, and made you know maybe five different shades I also mixed in some white with the yellow to make a highlight shade in some of the parts and just made it kind of in a wood pattern there's a little knot in the wood and some lines and stuff and uh, then in the cracks I just used the straight brown and a very thin wash and that's all there is to it and I think that if you do this and you use these techniques 
Your stats are really going to come to life. Okay, I'm going to quickly go over some of the different things uh, with, the, with our set that we built here. Now the ship set is incomplete. Um, there's a chance that we could fit the rest of this ship if we decided to build it in our garage. But one thing to consider when building a set is the size of your puppets and the size of the set um, need to fit in the space that you have. And you also have to fit things like lights. We have a, uh, a home-built light stand here. Uh, we have some C stands. And you have to also consider that real life gets in the way. And we have over here like a Christmas tree in the garage. And a cooler. And some other stuff. You know, boxes of plates and bowls. And, you know, things that we tried to store away. So, if you have a studio or a garage, the first thing you need to do is figure out when you're before you build it is how much space you have. I mean, you can't build an epic giant battleground for, you know, a thousand puppets or anything like that because, you know, how are you going to fit it in your garage? So, before you plan your uh to do anything like storyboarding or set building, make sure that, you know, you can actually do it. Um, a lot of people make that mistake and they, they get high hopes and think of, you know, think really big, which is great, but also keep in mind that you need practicality too, because here we are walking around the set, and this gives us just enough room to fit in here, you know, so we can get up here and grab our puppets. Okay, with most sets, one common practice is building them in such a way that the animator is comfortable in working on the set itself and also sets are made to come apart most of the time because of camera angles for your your shots um, also if a, an animator wants to reach into a certain area and there's a wall then you know you're gonna have some problems uh, you know you can't put your hand through here and animate a puppet so one way to counteract that problem is to remove a wall by making it detachable and the way we do that is just simply to design it so that the uh, the plywood that you put on the side has some sort of a way to uh, connect to your set base and can just be clamped so what I've done on underneath here is I just extended a 2x2 two two, uh, beam straight down from the top and this way I can put a, a clamp like this and keep that nice and secure on the side so that's one of the most common you know the most basic things to uh, to do so for example if the camera view is this you want this angle here and you want to look at that cannon right there so you want to let's say zoom in but you want the angle of the camera right here so the set's in the way. Well, you would just remove this, pull this off, set it to the side, and away you go. Um, extremely important to, to think about when you're storyboarding especially because that's where you figure out all your angles, your camera angles, and uh, let's say you're going to pan the camera if you make a rig. Um, you know, it's very it's very simple to do, and it just requires a little bit extra thought. So always make your set walls removable with clamps or screws. So let's see what else. Um, the other thing is, now for example, here if I were to grab Ruble, you can see that I'm stretching here, and I can't reach him. So anybody who's animating is going to have a problem. Um, so if I want to have the camera in the shot like this at this exact spot well I can't reach the puppet so what do you do? well if you storyboarded it where you have to anim animate the puppet at this exact angle you want to make it so that the set can come apart and you can reach the puppet so with this set here you probably can't tell from the top because it's an invisible sort of seam in the center um, but if I take this away um, you'll see that these are actually two sets side by side 
and they are right next to each other all the way to the floor. Underneath, I have a clamp that's holding both halves together. And so what I did is on the two halves, I glued a piece of wood on either side. Then I just put the clamp right between them and it closes it. We also have a screw here in the center that gives it a little bit more security um, just in case. So when we remove this, we just unscrew it, unclamp it, and the two halves will just slide right apart. So this way I can set the camera up nice and close to the puppet here, and I can put the tripod to the left, and I can reach the puppet. So um, that's a, another way to fool the camera. Uh, you know, making removable parts, really simple, very, very common. Um, Hmm, what more can I say? I think that pretty much does it. I mean, just make sure that your set isn't too high, too low. Make sure the animator can reach the puppets. In the case of, for example, up here, I have these levels. I have one, two, three levels. But the bottom of that half of the set here is actually sitting on an extension piece below it. So if I want to lower that half of the set to animate on it, I just remove this lower area here, set that top part down on the floor, and everything in this part of the ship where I have clamps holding parts together is the same for the upper part. I just have screws instead. So I can take those side pieces off if I like. I can even remove these stairs in case the camera should have to be in this area here shooting through in this direction. Okay, let's talk about green screen. Uh, green screen is a term used for the background which is painted green and is replaced digitally in computers. Um, so any kind of digital program like Adobe Premiere or Photoshop uh, you can remove the green. So the trick to that is getting the correct green color or you can use blue or other colors um, just as long as they're solid they're bright and they don't have that color in your set so if our ship is green obviously the background when we remove that it's going to also remove the foreground and it's not what you want to have happen so green screen I'm using here but you know, I'm going to have to use a different color for some of the shots because I have a green zombie that's going to come down from the top here in the scene. So I'm probably going to use orange or some kind of hot pink color because that would be the farthest color from any of the colors that are included in the set. So um, now the green back there I brought in a home center. And... Um, I mean, most of the colors, like this blue here, I also brought in a home center. So, any sort of really large amounts of paint that you're going to buy, um, there's no reason to spend like, you know, $100 a gallon for chroma key paints because this stuff works just as well and it costs only maybe $15 a gallon in Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, hardware stores, and Sher Sherwin Williams is another company that makes paints. Um, so I'm going to come over here and show you some of these colors that I found in a, um, where did I find these? I don't know if it was a hobby shop or, it might have been Staples actually. I think Staples carries this paper. It's just, you know, different colored construction paper. It's a good quality, almost like a cardboard. Um, let's see if I can get it in focus. But, um... These colors are great because, as you can see, uh, if I wanted to use this hot pink, it would work great because, you know, like I say, the set is blue and uh, we have this hot pink color. And if I have a green zombie coming down in the back, that green isn't the same color as this. And I can remove this more cleanly as a color in an effects program. So, um, another great thing about this kind of construction paper is that you can cut out squares, and if you have a TV set, 
or a movie theater screen or anything that you want to have moving in the background you can even place this in a window in the set and you know insert live actors in your miniature set uh, I mean there's just a lot of possibilities you can use with this so um you know this only cost a few dollars I guess maybe a, even just a dollar actually I mean this does really cheap it's really accessible comes in a lot of colors you can see here I mean look how pure that green is I mean that would remove really cleanly in a shot if uh, you had a puppet sitting in front of it so um, green screen is really important I'm gonna have uh, an ocean behind our shot here and like I said I'm gonna have to use some kind of hot pink or orange because um, I'll have that green zombie coming in and I don't want to have the program remove the zombie by accident. Um, so another thing is uh, with this green screen is I used a piece of 4x8 I guess half inch or maybe quarter inch drywall and so it's got like a frame behind it which you can't see made from wood and it's screwed to that frame and then I have some legs which are made from wood come down and attach to a flat wooden base that makes it really secure um, you know you have also the option of using fabrics which will work and they don't reflect the light very much which is good because you don't want to have a shiny surface but the drawback with cloth is that you'll get creases and folds and if dirt gets on it it's hard to remove and with drywall it's a really super flat surface and um, you can always paint over stuff if you get like a smudge of dirt or paint on it uh, or you bump into it and scratch it it's easy to fix um, so that's pretty much it for green screen just make sure you use any color besides the color of your set make sure it's on a smooth surface and um, that's it for green screen alright here we are at the uh, the bottom of our set and one thing I want to stress with sets is that if your set isn't built well or if it's a little flimsy uh, maybe a little shaky one thing you want to make sure you do is always look for gaps under the set here's a gap so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some wood shims and actually this isn't really a shim this is just a piece of wood but you can buy shims which are uh, you know, a dime a dozen. Make sure you shim any areas where there's gaps. The reason for this is because you don't want to have the set above wobble when you're working on your animation. The other thing is make sure you weigh your set down. There's a nice big container of kills, uh, just a primer, and I think that's like you know two gallons, so it weighs a lot. Um, make sure you do this before you animate because any kind of motion above here any shaking uh, is going to ruin your shots so you know add some kills make sure that where you add it you don't bump it with your foot and you know you can ruin your shot that way too so you know add your weights and stuff around the outer edges and that will really improve the sturdiness of your set especially if it's light one extremely common question I get almost on a daily basis with my website is if you drill a hole in your set floor for a tie down or a screw to tie a puppet's foot to the set you know aren't you ruining your sets you know you built this intricate set and then you just go in and drill holes all over the place I mean it's, everyone's like you know how can you do that it's crazy so one of the things that people do in stop motion is one of two things usually um, they'll take something like tape like this scotch tape and they'll just cover that hole with a piece of tape and take some paint that's the same color as the set and paint it another thing is to mix up colors of clay that are the same exact color and shade as the set floor um, I mean that's pretty much all you need to do and then take a tool and just work it into that hole and that hides the holes really well but if you notice so I'm gonna move the camera down here can you really see a hole I mean is it really that obvious 
most people, if the camera is back far enough, will never even notice. So a lot of times you can drill holes all over the place, and especially if we have a puppet that's here and he's denting around, you know, you're going to be looking at the motion as opposed to, you know, is there a little hole here, is there some dust, or maybe a piece of dirt. Your eye always moves towards the motion. So, you know, don't get too uptight about making holes in your set for tie-downs. Um, just use one of those two techniques where you take some tape, cover the hole and paint it, or mix up some clay the same color and just press it right into that hole. Nobody will even notice. Okay, the last technique I need to talk about is forced perspective. Um, in set building terms, a lot of times what you have is you have a horizon line, you have background objects. Let's say for the sake of argument this is a, the background of a city. Then we would have mid-ground objects which cover the background objects. Let's say a building here, a building here, and then you'll have foreground objects which are even closer which will take up a lot more of this of what you see. And as you can see, if you draw a line, everything points to the horizon. So um, this isn't all that accurate, but if you've ever drawn, for example, train tracks, you'll notice that things get spaced out differently the closer they are to the camera. The closer things are to the camera, the further things are spaced. So with, in the case of train tracks, these closer um, lines in the back are going to be farther away. So usually if you're thinking of building a giant set, let's say for example, just for the sake of you know argument, we have our background city, mid-ground objects such as um, buildings and factories and stuff, and then we have these closer buildings. Now, um, if you're building a set and you want to build something that's that large, you might say, well, that's impossible. You know, you would have to have a set, this, you know, the, the size of your house, just for your, um, you know, your puppets to live in, and who can be bothered? Well, a lot of times what people do is they'll make objects in the background purposely small, objects in the midground scaled up slightly, and foreground objects the normal scale of what your puppets uh, need for you know for movement and animation. All right, so here's your puppet, and your puppet, let's say he's eight inches tall, from head to feet. Well, this very far background object, like these buildings, could be sculpted or uh, you know made from balsa wood, or you can even cut out photocopies of real buildings and make them eight inches tall and place them two foot in behind your character and it would fool the audience into, into thinking it's really far because that object is a smaller scale than your puppet and it's only you know it's this, it's the same height mid-ground objects might be ten inches tall and you know foreground objects might be you know fifteen inches tall let's say it's a building or a house or whatever so from the top down Essentially what you would have is your set, you would have your puppets here, foreground objects here, let's say it's just the front of a building, mid-ground objects here, and background objects here, and the distance between uh, the size of your, you know, the front and back of your set can only be four foot, but when it's tilted upwards, the illusion of distance is greater because the background objects are so much smaller. It also helps if your horizon line is a little bit higher than a horizon line that's equal to the feet of your puppets. So for example, background objects, mid-ground, and foreground. You know, either way, but um, I prefer to raise the horizon line up just a little bit to give a little bit more illusion of distance. Um, 
but either way it, it should work out okay for you um, so just you know force perspective will save you a lot of space when it comes to making a set that you want to appear really large well, I hope that gives you some ideas for set building um, obviously I can't build 10 sets to explain every detail so I had to resort to sketches and things but um, for the most part that's um, those are the major things related to set building such as the force perspective, the painting, you know, the, the scales and you know how everything is put together so the camera can get into this into the shots and so forth. So um, I think that pretty much I've, I've covered everything I can uh, with what I have in, in this garage. But if you have any other questions, just go ahead and give me an email or a call and I'll try and help you out.